Hello, so today's lecture is still about speech and mainly about um, speech recognition, but it's really talking about the lo low resource case. Um, I said before that speech recognition requires an acoustic model, a pronunciation model, and a language model. And um, that's sort of true, but sometimes you don't have that. And so the question is, what can you do when you don't have that? And how can you still do speech recognition? And so what I'm going to do today is go through a number of techniques that we have, um, we and others have um, researched into in order to be able to deal with cases where you don't have all of the standard uh, um, information. It's always better if you do have the standard information, but sometimes that's not available and sometimes you can't do that for hundreds of languages. So you want to find alternative methods that allow you to get good enough um, recognition for whatever your downstream task actually is. Um, so the first one, let's talk about no lexicon, okay? So we talked about we need a pronunciation lexicon. And actually, instead of that, you could just use grapheme, so the orthographic form, okay? And that doesn't mean necessarily romanized, but it can be whatever the orthographic form actually is. Now, it's worth noting that there are some languages this is much, much harder for, while others there are often, there's a good relationship between the writing and the actual pronunciation. So it happens some of the big resourced languages and some of the biggest languages on the planet have got a fairly um, uh, um, opaque um, uh, relationship between the writing and the pronunciation. And in fact, English, Chinese and Arabic are probably the hardest ones on the planet. Um, which is sort of okay because we have resources for these languages. And so we don't need to care about things purely as a, um, a grapheme based um, form. It still works for English, but you need an awful lot more data. It doesn't really work for Chinese if you do it based on Hanzi on the Chinese character. If you do it with Pinyin, so the Romanized form where effectively you're getting some sort of pronunciation based form, then actually for Chinese, it works pretty well, even without tones. As long as you have lots of data, it actually works. Arabic is still rather hard because the vowels aren't actually there in the written form, so they magically come from somewhere in context that makes it harder. Though, although you may believe that your language, your target language is nicely um, uh, phonetic and that your native informants tell you it is, okay, do not believe them. Okay, because actually native speakers always think the pronunciation is easy, while externally it's not. Okay, now sometimes it's not important on that, and sometimes you can get by. So um, most people believe that Hindi is very easy to pronounce, and the answer is well, actually, there's a schwa deletion thing that's almost magic, um, where there's a vowel gets deleted when it gets deleted. And um, for all the Hindi speakers out there, you should be aware that when non-native Hindi speakers are speaking, um, see how often they make errors on that. I'm thinking of the Telugu speakers who often make errors on that. Um, and in fact, across all the Indian languages has some form of schwa deletion almost in the same place, but it's only almost in the same place. So it can be quite hard to predict. Remember that an awful lot of things, especially high tech online things, are very likely to have English borrowed words. So although the language that you're dealing with is nicely phonetic, all of a sudden you're gonna get an English word and you're gonna to have to deal with its pronunciation to be able to recognize it. Yes, it might get written in a more phonetic form. Japanese might do that, but um, actually it often doesn't because often people are literate in English and therefore that's a problem. Um, a, does phonetic information actually help? So can we just use the letters? And the answer is yes, unquestionably it does. And there's a bunch of experiments that we've done that show that having phonetic information, like knowing whether it's a vowel, knowing whether it's a stop, knowing whether it's a nasal um, uh, from the letter actually allows to get better um, uh, generalizations in your model. And in fact, there was a piece of work that um, a student at um, CMU LTI called Julia Svetkov, you might have heard of her, um, did when she was at the end of when she was a student, um, looking at how easy it is and or how hard it is to discover phonetic like features or at least sub features of um, uh, phonemes or letters 
um, automatically um, from data. And the answer is you sort of can, as long as you have a reasonable amount of data, you can definitely look at similarities across forms and it competes with them, the actual knowledge of the phonetic form. But we do have the knowledge of the phonetic form. One of the experiments that we have done is if you just take the English letters and you assign them into some generic phonetic class. So AEI, OU and Y go into vowels, um, uh, M, N go into um, nasals, um, PTK um, and um, uh, B, D, uh, G all go into stops. If you just give that information, things get better, okay? Um, so yes, you can do without it, but if you can get that information, it's better. Be aware there's only about 100 writing systems-ish, okay? But remember the writing system gets often used across multiple languages and it may get used inappropriately and it may get used um, quite differently across different languages. And so you should be aware, but there's a sort of a much better defined finite set of writing systems. And that's actually because Unicode has a committee that doesn't want to add anything to it. Um, and so it's somewhat restricted. And so theoretically, it's possible to go and look at all of the writing systems and give some pronunciation, some phonetic-like information. And in fact, in Unicode, for the non-Latin characters, there's actually a field in Unicode that allows you to give a Latin representation of that character. And that Latin representation is pretty much a phonetic pronunciation. So you can get a pronunciation for all of those interesting other alphabets that exist. And um, it's not for all graphemes. It doesn't care, cater for all of the uh, Romanized ones. And there's an awful lot of those. Most languages on the planet are using some form of Romanized form, maybe with extra characters. Uh, it does not, uh, in Unicode, give it for um, uh, um, CJK, Chinese. Uh, Japanese and Korean, uh, but that's sort of okay because we sort of have that. Of course, we don't really have that for the Chinese dialects, and we'd like to be able to do that apart from um, Cantonese and um, uh, Mandarin. Um, uh, there's an excellent program called Epitran done by David Mortensen here at CMU. There's a paper, LREC, but much more importantly, it's a uh, um, Python um, uh, program that basically will take in for first approximation, any graphemes and give you an IPA representation, okay? Now, of course, it's not always going to get it right, but it often will. It was based originally on the information that's in the Unicode, um, but David has spent quite a lot of time making sure that it does reasonably with um, uh, um, languages of interest and covering them. And it's probably as best you're going to do in the short term, even in its most generic form, if you do a language that has not got official support, it's still going to do pretty well. Um, sometimes it's worth fixing that, and sometimes it just isn't worth fixing that. It depends on what you're doing, but it's a good place to always start. End-to-end um, -end systems um, uh, often are quite good at addressing spelling variation. Remember, only the big languages have got standard spelling. Most other languages, you can spell randomly. English used to be like that um, before the updated word, but if you look at things from the 18th century, um, even within the same paragraph, people will have multiple spellings of the same word because it didn't matter. And it's not wrong, it's just different. And that's true for most languages. And that sort of breaks lots of things because suddenly you have the same word actually written in a different way. So it looks like a different word, but it's not really a different word. And that can be hard to work out. Yes, if you have an infinite amount of data and you build a BERT type model, it's going to be able to deal with it, but you don't have an infinite amount of data. So it's always a little hard. Um, but if you can map these things to phonemes, sometimes that deals with some of the spelling errors because often the spelling errors are actually um, just alternatives. And sometimes they're alternatives because they're influenced by the colonial language, for want of a better word. Um, so English or Spanish or Russian um, or put on what. Um, uh, what happens if you don't have transcribed data and you're trying to build an acoustic model? This is a fairly common uh, form where you have broadcast news, so high quality audio um, that's well performed, um, that would be good if it was transcribed for being able to build models. And you have that from some YouTube form of, of the state news or standard news that's coming out of uh, the country. 
there's no subtitles, which is often the case. So uh, how do you get transcription? But you also have newspaper text, which may or may not be talking about the same thing, but it's definitely the same style as what you get on, um, uh, on the broadcast news, but it's not transcription. Can you use that? And the problem is you have to do some sort of bootstrapping thing. So what you have to do is have some acoustic model that you don't have to be able to do the recognition. So that's probably going to be some sort of cross-lingual model. So you're going to have some cross-lingual acoustic model that cares about phonemes from maybe a nearby language or a language you just happen to have. And then you're going to have an in-language um, language model built from the news stories. So you have to have pronunciation model based on that and some way to evaluate the quality in some way, because what you want to do is you want to do recognition with this cross-lingual model, find out which ones were good by some definition of good, and then use that new label data in order to be able to um, uh, build an actual in-language acoustic model. And this seems harder. No, when people try to do this, it ends up being harder than what? It sort of looks like on paper. So it's not quite as successful. And every case I've ever seen where people are trying to do this, it always helps to actually have some data that's actually properly aligned in that target data that is corrected. Now, it can be as little as 20 minutes, but having that always makes things better. And so just doing it completely unsupervised seems to still be a problem. Although I'm going to come back with, to that in an example a little bit later on. Um, there's probably always some transcribed data, as we said, and Graham said in the, the, um, in the translation case, when you're looking for data, there's almost always something. There's some religious text uh, or Unix manuals, which may or may not be religious, um, that are available. So there's always something and an audio well, there's often a Bible. Um, a, oops, I haven't got the title right on this slide. Um, so there's a site called Bible.is, um, which has collected together actually about 2,000 different languages and has got the text of the New Testament. Um, and about half of them have got audio associated with them. So there's a chapter of text and there's an MP3 with audio. Um, so all read speech, although there's a little bit of music in the background, which has clearly been added later. It's the same music across them all, but it's very clear. The recordings have been collected over some time, probably 30, 40 years. Um, uh, separated into book chapters, it's not sentence aligned, so we can't just use this off the shelf. And what we really, really need is sentence by sentence with alignment of the text. Now you'd think maybe you could do that by looking for the breaks and maybe you could find the verses in the Bible and that would be okay. But of course, that's really hard because people don't make prosodic breaks in the places that they're supposed to. So what we did was took a program called InterSlice, not Splice, although Splice is a good name as well, InterSlice that uh, Kishore Prahalad did when he was a PhD student a long time ago. We originally built this for taking audiobooks and partitioning them, segmenting them into um, a line sentence when you have a certain um, set of text and a certain set of audio, can you find the alignment? And that works well if you have an acoustic model for the targeted language. But um, here for Bible.is, we don't because we're dealing with 904 different languages for which we do not have an acoustic model. So what we did was we modified InterSlice to be able to use a, a universal model or at least a um, language independent model and try to get a first approximation of this. It doesn't quite work, but it often works a bit. Now, as you're doing the alignment of sentence, you can get misaligned, sometimes because the person doesn't say what's in the text, sometimes because the text is just different what's being there, or sometimes there's just something that happens in it and it gets misaligned and can't realign itself properly. Um, so you maybe only get the first few verses of some of the chapters. But once you get that, what we can do is we can build another model that's now in that particular um, uh, language. So it's much better. And over the 904, actually, we've only successfully um, aligned 700 languages. We end up with something that's much better than the, the language independent model. And it can go from being marginal, you get a few hours of alignment to getting on average about 20 hours, 
the New Testament gets spoken in about 24 to 26 um, hours of recording. Now, we also need a pronunciation model for all of these different languages. And although many of them have got some form of romanization, they've got all of the different writing systems that you would expect from all around the planet. Um, we also use an Epitran type thing, um, which actually Richard Sprott did a number of years ago when he was at uh, um, UIUC. It's called Unitran. Um, it's somewhat similar. It's been updated over the years for speech synthesis. And it's quite good. Um, I should probably have used Epitran when we did this, but um, Unitran is fully integrated. And so we did that. Um, the same new wilderness data set, um, which was released last year, has about 20 hours of aligned text audio for 700 languages. You can build speech recognizers or text to speech from that. Um, there are scores that tell you because some of them are better than, um, than others. Um, and so that's important because some of the alignments really don't go very well and some of them do go well and are really quite excellent. I mean, about 70, 80% of them are really very usable, the text-to-speech that we often used as a measure of how well we were actually um, getting the alignment is quite deployable. Um, uh, remember, this isn't all languages. Um, it's very much guided towards the languages that missionaries would care, care about. So. In some sense, many of the major languages on the planet um, are not included in the wilderness set. So many of the European languages are missing, especially the non-standard or the non-major languages. There's no German on this at all, um, but that's okay. We've got German elsewhere. And also, if you look at the dots on there, there's almost nothing in um, uh, the USA and Canada. I mean, there's one um, which is Ojibwe, which is um, spoken um, in both uh, um, uh, US and Canada. Um, actually, there's a few more. Um, uh, there's some Yupik in there, but most of them are concentrated in the, the equatorial um, area. There are more languages there than anywhere else, but you know there are things missing and there's nothing in Australia. And this is probably partly because people in Canada and um, the US and in Australia, even those who are um, speaking indigenous languages, probably speak English as well but we would like to be able to cover those as well, okay? So there's still things that are missing um, uh, from this. And it's quite strange that you have 700, which is maybe a 10th of the languages, and there's still an awful lot are missing, and it's really pretty easy to find languages that are not actually uh, um, there. Um, uh, also, it should be noted that actually for some of these languages, this might be the only text in that language because some of these languages are pretty low resource. Um, there's links on our distribution that go to the Wikipedia pages that identify usually the population. And some of these languages have got 4,000 speakers in 1983. That probably means they have a lot less than 4,000 speakers and may have no speakers anymore. But some of these languages, I suspect, the Bible is it when it comes to um, text. Now, this brings in this whole issue of why do we think languages should have a written form? Okay. Anyway, um, I'll get onto that in a minute. Before I go into that, I'd like to actually talk about a particular um, research project that's here at CMU called Allosaurus that Xinjian Li has um, been working on for some time. Um, what it does is it takes acoustics to IPA. Hey, won't that solve our whole problem of recognition? Well, yes and no. Yes, it will give you something, but it won't necessarily give you the correct thing because it's going to make decisions based on the acoustics and the acoustics are going to be very varied because acoustics are very varied. There's not always a correct answer. And when if you give it to an expert phonologist who's transcribing it, they're going to transcribe what they hear and what the person says, which may not be the standardized word that the person was intending to say. One of the things we do in speech recognition is standardize the speech recognition to get to standard words. And so if you're just going to listen to how I say things and how standard American accent Graham is saying things, we will say things in different ways, but when transcribed, we want the same word. Okay, or word. Oh no, he doesn't. He's got ours um, in his uh, in his words. Um, so that's not going to work. Okay, it's going to give you the IPA, and if actually it's really not going to give you the IPA, it's going to give some allophone of what the IPA maybe should be for the person who knows what the language is. However, this is excellent 
there's an online thing from uh, um, Shenzhen's um, site where you can just upload any arbitrary audio and it'll give you some form of IPA back that will be closely related. He trained it on multiple languages. And in fact, if you can name the language, it can take uh, information from the foible site of the phone lists for that language that allow you to constrain the recognition to the targeted phonemes that you believe to be in that language. Now, Foible has 2,000 languages, but rather interestingly, the overlap between the wilderness data and the Foible stuff isn't very good. What? Yeah, well, that's because, especially when you get down to very particular low resource languages, the names and the distribution of them are very, very different. And so it can be quite hard to be able to do mapping and people will make different definitions of where the language boundaries are. And it may be that two languages are very close to each other, but they've got different names because they are different, but acoustically they could be similar and that information is not there. So um, Allosaurus is an excellent resource which we can often use for helping us bootstrap, especially in cross-lingual cases and allow us to do some sort of adaptation. Now, so far, everything we've been talking about is having the assumption that there's a written form. And this is a very, um, naive view of the world, okay, um, that a language has a written form. And it is true, especially if you're at CMU, you're going to be used to this idea that there is a literacy. And when you're, le when you're learning a language, you usually try and get the written form and try to understand it. And so you can also remember things and look at things offline rather than just interacting with people. But actually, most languages in the world are not written. Most languages are not written. There's only a few that are written. And there's a whole bunch of languages that are not well written. Okay, now we have the not well written ones, the ones that are maybe sometimes written. And um, this could be include the Arabic dialects because most of the time when people write Arabic, they write more than a standard Arabic. So they move into a different register, a different dialect, a different even language, depending what your definition is of that boundary. And when they're writing things down and when they're writing down their own dialect, they mix it in some way that's really not well specified. Um, if you look at the Indian languages, the regional languages, um, Hindi, Telugu, Tamil, um, actually most people, um, especially uh, most people who are at higher education, will be primarily literate in English because that's where they do most of their writing. They can write in the regional language, but they don't do it very often. And actually, when they're doing it, they're probably writing in a Romanized form and they're not writing in the regional form. They can all read it because they were taught it at school, but they don't use it in anywhere near the same level that they're using English. And that's very common. OK, and you get the other cases where people, well, I don't write down the language I use at home because I use the language at home. And so that's where speech and text disintegrate. And we end up with this, well, how can we deal with speech if we don't have any written form to convert it to? And um, well, the answer is, why do you want the text anyway? Why do you want the text? Uh, I want to search, I want to do translation, I want to do understanding. And so then the question becomes, well, maybe you can do that with speech and you don't actually have to have a written form. So one way you could do is say, I'm going to make a written form. Um, don't underestimate how hard that is. We've tried to do that in a number of languages and you think, yeah, I'll get the IPA. And it's like, no, there's not a lot. I'll get a romanization because people are already writing a romanization, I'll do it. And there's lots of noise in that, okay? The other thing that happens, we particularly did this for um, Iraqi Arabic, uh, writing in Arabic script but we had to train all of the Iraqi um, speakers to be able to write it down because every time they wrote it down, they kept writing MSA. They kept translating it in their head into the other language that they had been taught to read and write. And so when somebody says a word, they write down the standardized one in the other language rather than the word that somebody said. Um, because it's really hard not to do that. And I'm very much aware of this if I'm trying to write Scots English I keep writing standard English because, or with funny spellings, and I don't write the actual word that I would use in Scots because, well, I never write that down, okay? And so this actually is a problem of teaching people and making them standardized 
Okay, and this is my even much bigger problem if you actually want to introduce a new writing system to a country, which people do regularly, and really it's hard and it takes, you know, 50 years to be able to do it because you've got to get a whole generation going through and actually people change their writing system in 50 years often, so you have um, issues with it. Um, I'm going to step a little bit away from ASR because I'm going to give an example in text to speech, even though we're really going to talk about text to speech in the next lecture. But I'm going to give you an example of this of doing text to speech without the text. Okay, because there was a bunch of work, there was a PhD um, uh, work on two of my students and a bunch of master's students um, five years ago um, that were looking at um, uh, these issues. So, can I build a synthesizer in the language without knowing the text? So, I have some audio. I maybe know something about that audio, I maybe know the translation, and I'll talk about translation in this case, but just imagine I have all that audio. Um, what I could do is I could recognize um, with a cross-lingual recognizer, and in this case, for this particular work, we didn't have Allosaurus at the time, so we just used English, um, because we have good phonetic recognizers in um, English um, already built. And then what we do is we'll get a labeling of our data with English phonemes, not with the target language. And yes, that's going to miss a lot of the context and the forms of the, um, the target language that we're dealing with. But maybe we're going to select a language which is close to the target language we're trying to deal with. But once we get that labeling, we can rebuild a speech recognizer, uh, an acoustic speech recognizer that recognizes phonemes. So we've still got the names of English, but now they're going to be adapted to what the acoustics are in the target language. And then we can repeat that process of doing recognition, getting the result, and then redoing that. And when do you stop? Well, what we do is each one is we take whatever these labels are, these strings of English phonemes, and we build a speech synthesizer out of it and independently test the quality of the speech synthesizer using a, a, an acoustic distance so we don't need a, a speaker to be able to do this. And so Siniana um, Sitharam, who's now at Microsoft um, uh, Research in India, um, did this um, with a bunch of other people. Um, and we have an ICAS paper in 2013. And I'm going to show you an example of actually doing that. So we have this loop that we're basically doing recognition in English, but we could do, use a different language. Um, uh, um, to do recognition, what we do is we get a new transcription out of it. We then independently build a speech synthesizer out of whatever those transcriptions are and measure the quality of that. And independently, we have that other route where we end up um, um, relabeling the data um, with a new recognizer based on the recognition that we get. So here's an example of doing this. The, this is a graph for um, a we're using the English um, uh, as the cross-lingual recognizer and the target language is German, okay? Which these languages are very similar. They're phonetically very similar and uh, syllable-wise, they're very similar. Um, and uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to play you a synthesized version of iteration zero, where we recognize with English and we build the synthesizer out of the stuff that come out, out of it. Uh, hopefully that's clear. Now, if you don't speak German, okay, you're going to say, yeah, that's German, okay? If you do speak German, you're going to say, what the hell is that? Some Dutch dialect or something? Because um, it's not very understandable. Um, uh, at each iteration, we get an improved value. I'm not going to go into details of what the value is, an acoustic value in the text of speech. So we actually get quite a good improvement. And then it gets bad and then it gets better. And then it gets bad and it gets better. What's actually happening here is we're losing phonemes. So suddenly we build a model, we do recognition, and we no longer recognize a phoneme. And so suddenly everything gets worse, we get a realignment, and then it actually gets better again. And it keeps doing this up and down. So here is an acoustic um, form here that is um, a, um, our best that we can get. So this is not knowing any text for German and ending up with a symbolic representation of German that's actually English phonetics, or at least the labels are English phonetics, but they don't necessarily mean English phonetics. Um, if you play that to German person, they mostly get that um, recognition. And for those of you know Florian, yes, that is Florian speaking. Okay. And um, here's the original thing that he said. Now, I'm doing a little trick here. I'm playing German to you, and none of you probably speak German, so that you think that um, 
uh, uh, so that I can pretend that it actually works. So let's actually do this um, for English. So what we do in English, instead of using the English recognizer, um, we uh, actually use an Indic recognizer. So we took all of our Indian languages and pretended that the British Empire was the other way around and India went to the UK and took over and just said, it's all Indian, um, which actually it is at the moment. But anyway, um, and so again, we get our first iterative form of trying to get a representation for English. And here's one of these things that goes wrong um, because we ended up deleting some phoneme in one uh, form, and, but it settles down and we end up with others. So here's the first one. Okay, um, and so this is iteration zero, where we get again a, um, a representation of English without actually doing, this should be better than what English writing systems actually are. I should say that the language model that we use for the phonemes is based on German, because it's a relatively close language. Can I have please? So what does that say? Well, let me play it again. Can I have please? So you might get something like, can I have mumble, 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 please? I'll do this. But if we do this iterative form and we get to the best one, we get this. Can I have a disembarkation card, please? Um, rather interestingly, it contains a word that's pretty rare in English. In fact, it's very clearly the translation of a Japanese word. Okay, because I just don't think the word exists in English. So let me play it again. Can I have a disembarkation card, please? So he says, can I have a disembarkation card, please? So disembarkation is not a normal English word, but most people can actually hear that. So again, what we've done is we've got a representation of English that's symbolic, okay, sort of phonetic, um, that is sufficient for us to be able to build synthesizers out of it that are understandable. And that's cool, okay? That's useful. That's what we'd like to be able to do. Now, what can we do with that? Because remember, we've now got a random writing system that nobody knows and people can't really read. You can sort of read it, but you can't really read it. Um, there's no word boundaries. Um, it's written in some phonetic form that may not actually be properly phonetic because it's drifted um, in its recognition. So you get a symbolic representation, 45-ish different phonemes that have got some ordering on them. And the question is, can you do anything with it? I mean, humans can't really do much with it, but can we do some other stage with it? Okay. So can we do speech translation, not speech to text, text to text translation and text to speech, but speech to speech, okay? No text was hurt in any of this form. Actually, that's usually not what we do. We usually go from speech to translating in text in the other form. And usually we've got a relatively high resource in the text form. So we're taking speech in some language and trying to translate it into um, uh, English or Spanish or Russian or something that we've got relatively high amount of data from. Um, finding data is surprisingly hard for this. You want speech to translation in another form, you can fake it, and we often fake it, but it's not really the same thing because what we really would like is genuine text in one language and speech in another language. If you ask people to do the translation, it doesn't really work because the, you get translated speech instead of actual native speech. Um, we've done this with synthetic data, um, we've used the wilderness data because the Bible is a translation, but they're somewhat limited and they were always translated from English or Spanish or whatever the Bible was that was translated into that target form. I mean, ultimately, um, uh, it comes from Greek, it's New Testament. Um, <coughs> uh, but it's um, uh, not quite as general, but it is real speech, but we've done that as well. Europarl actually has it, and Sebastian Stucker at, at Karlsruhe has done work on it, and Liz Seleski, who was a master's student, CMU and she's now at Charles Hopkins, um, have done this with um, Spanish and English that's available from Europarl. And there should also be more translation type things that are available like this, but it's quite hard to actually find. Um, but phones might not be enough because um, there's lots of confusability in these phone things that we're recognized when we're doing things like this. Um, and so we really would like to join these together into some sort of longer units. Um, and so we like to discover words. And so there's a bunch of people that are doing this. And this is actually the discussion thing today is about how could you take these strings of noisy phonetic type symbols and try to discover word type objects 
longer things. Sharon Goldwater, who's a professor at Edinburgh University now for her PhD way back, which was somewhere in um, the US, I can't remember, um, and her students now um, at Edinburgh have been working on this for a long time, given a string of some phonetic like form, how can we discover the distribution of words in there? We and others have done things about trying to do engram discovery, trying to do syllable type discovery, trying to do BPE, so looking at the distribution and at the Goldwater algorithm. Um, and uh, there are some comparisons in some work that was done last year with us um, at Interspeech. Um, uh, you can also look at the actual acoustic sequences for Hermann Camper, who's now at Pretoria or Stellenbosch in um, South Africa, has been doing that. He was one of Sharon's students, um, and so he's very much a lead in uh, this uh, form. This then leads to this whole aspect of intent discovery from acoustics. So instead of trying to get the words out, what you try to get is the sort of meaning out. Um, and maybe you don't really need words, or you maybe need these sequences of things to influence it, but these sequences don't have to be things that humans can understand as words, if machines can understand them as words. If you're aware about how dialogue systems work with things like um, uh, Alexa um, and Siri, usually ASR happens and you get some words out of it, and then there's an intent classifier that looks at the sequences of these words and looks at the words and how they do and looks at probabilities of expectations and how to say things and try to work out this is setting a timer, this is um, uh, asking for the weather, um, this is a search for Google and trying to work out with these things in based on the words, maybe the sequences of words and maybe just the bag of words and you can do surprisingly well even with just the bag of words. So the question is these phoneme thingies that we get out of um, a, a unwritten languages or the sequences we get out of using um, Shannon Goldwater type algorithms, do we, um, can we use those for finding out how to understand that? And there's a bunch of examples of things that are actually trying to do that. So there's this thing called Polly that Ali Raza did for his PhD when he was at um, CMU more than five years ago. Um, he's now a professor in um, Pakistan. Um, a, he built in his part of his work with Ronnie Rosenfeld a job search system that was based on the telephone that was deployed in Bangalore um, and it was designed for people who couldn't read and write um, and so it was all speech based and he didn't have a recognizer for um, a, a Canada which was the main language that he was actually dealing with so he just did um, keyword searching and he did keyword searching by using an English recognizer and getting whatever the English recognizer gets, a bunch of random words, but it might be relatively consistent and it's definitely highly correlated with what the Canada apparently random uh, stuff is. In the same way that we were doing English initial labeling for phonemes, you could just use a very simple um, English um, recognizer and see what you get. And as long as things are relatively constrained and somewhat different um, uh, the intents can actually be reckoned with the wrong recognizer, wrong language recognizer, and still get something out of it. Um, MSR India um, did a bunch of work on looking at voice search for agricultural video, some things, access, um, I don't know what the PTA is, um, uh, and the idea there for low literate um, farmers want to find the YouTube video that they can actually watch, but they don't know how to type it in. And I mean, they're not literate and they don't even know what language it is. And even if it is what language they write it in, uh, there isn't transcription of the video to be able to know how to do it. So what they did was they did recognition um, in a sort of cross-lingual way, an index cross-lingual way um, of the um, the videos and find the words that actually appear in the videos. So if the person says it and then find out when people are looking up and so that they can use the name. One, one of the specific problems you have with agricultural terms is they change every 50 kilometers. I mean, they, the names for the plants, the vegetation, the weeds, the techniques, um, how you describe the land changes incredibly quickly, about 50 kilometers. And this is true for most of the world actually. Um, uh, we get dialect changes very quickly on specific things to do with agriculture. And so it's hard to even produce all the um, forms, but then, then it comes down to person says this word, then as this word is mentioned, we're going to play this video and give it to them. And um, there's a new piece of work that's being done here at CMU and Akshat um, Gupta, who might be watching.
watching this or not, um, has been looking at using the Allosaurus thing to do speech recognition um, and then be able to do multilingual intent. So we take um, a bunch of uh, <coughs> examples, we actually translate them into other languages, we build synthesis on these other languages, we then recognize them with Allosaurus and see if we can classify the original intent. And the answer is you can do pretty well and cross-lingually you can do pretty well. What about keyword matching? So you're just looking for particular words. That's a bit like the MSR one. Um, there was a big project from IARPA called Babel. It was looking at low resource languages and, and it gave a bunch of data. Actually, we started off with low resource being 100 hours, but by the end of the project, it was one hour. In fact, nowadays, most people are doing using that data to test things at zero hours. Um, it encouraged methods that were acoustic based, but actually ended up, most people ended up using some form of poor recognition and then a fuzzy match uh, to be able to match with the keywords. And that worked pretty well. The keywords had to be of some significant length. You couldn't really look for the word ah, uh, because it didn't work. Um, there's also a, a sort of came out of that at the same time, Aaron Jensen, who was at JHU, developed ZR tools, which is a thing that looks for repeated acoustic sequences in databases of speech. So it tries to build a model to look where things were repeating. Um, and it works surprisingly well if the speakers are very similar or the acoustics are very similar. So if you took a news program, you could pass it through and it would find out where a word had been repeated n times. And this allows you to index quite a lot about knowing what the subject of it is. And it often gets out the name of a person coming out um, uh, a number of times. It's computationally really expensive though, so it grinds everything to a halt when you're actually running it. There also is a, it's now almost an annual challenge called the Zero Resource Speech Challenge, um, which basically is doing a lot of this keyword matching in very low resource languages. The zero resource people are very interested in how humans learn languages which is not quite the same as how machines learn languages. And so there's sort of two tracks that are going there about, can you learn this from anything or can you use cross-lingual information to be able to uh, do that? Okay. The final point for um, the discussion point today, I would like to focus on acoustic word discovery and finding regular repeating acoustic sequences in acoustics. Okay, so you just got the acoustics. Can we find something that's like a word? Now, I'm not talking about space. There's no spaces. Um, uh, and I'm not talking about something that uh, um, a linguist says that's a word in the language. I'm talking about something that's useful to us in some downstream task. So what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to look at a paper that we did in 2016. It was one of the earlier papers we did that was looking at discovering acoustic um, word segmentation in speech-to-speech -speech translation. And it uses a bunch of different techniques. It compares phonemes, it compares um, engram techniques, it compares a syllabic form, and maybe includes the Goldwater stuff as well, I can't remember. Um, uh, I want you to look at, it's only a four page paper, and um, I want you to look at that. And I'd like you to discuss today um, what discovery techniques work and what other factors could influence some form of acoustic word discovery, word segmentation, something bigger than just looking at the phonetic forms and caring about the fact that the phonetic form is going to be a little noisy. Okay, so I'd like you to talk about that. Okay. Thank you. <laughs>